Our text this morning is a text that speaks about the meaning and purpose of Christmas with as much clarity and precision as any text in the Bible. This text that we're going to look at this morning in John, John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18, answers the question that the great theologian Charlie Brown asked. You've seen his special over and over, haven't you? He was having a typical Charlie Brown kind of day. Everything was going wrong. Picking out the Christmas tree was a major fail. The practice, the rehearsal that he was trying to conduct for the Christmas program was a major fail. Lucy was harassing him. That was pretty typical. Everything was just going wrong, and all the, all the commercialism and everything was so, so hectic. And, and finally, you remember, he just, he just, in his anguish, he cried out, What is Christmas all about? Well, what is Christmas all about? John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18, answer that question with precision and clarity. Let's look at it together. John chapter 1, and this I'm going to begin reading in verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Boy, there is a lot that could be said from these verses. And one of the challenges of preaching isn't saying everything that could be said, but saying what should be said at this time with this gathering of people. What would be the things that the Lord would want you, us, this morning to hear, to think about, uh, to act on is the real challenge. And so let's pray together. I need prayer this morning to know the things that to say you need the prayer this morning to be able to receive them in faith. So let's pray together as we, before we look at the word. Gracious God, it's our great joy to be together this morning. Every Sunday morning is a special morning. Thank you for everything that we've been singing together, for um, each word, Lord, that has been offered to you as a sacrifice of praise. And now, dear Father, as we turn our attention to this word, I pray for myself first, Lord, that you would help me to be a true preacher of the word. I pray for the gift of preaching. I pray, dear Father, that you would uh, give me wisdom, even with all the things that have been thought about and studied this week, to know uh, what should be said, how to say it. I pray, Lord, for your help in that. Lord, I pray you administer to each one who hears these words today. Lord, you know each heart. You know uh, what we bring to this service on the inside. Father, you see us perfectly. You know us even better than we know ourselves. And so it's our prayer that your spirit would would take the word of this text and uh, really make it hit home in each heart. And Father, what it is that each one needs today, may you... May you help them see it and give them grace, Lord, to receive it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Just simply put, as we look at this text and as we unpack it today, I want to look at it with this way. So you might think of these as as two hooks that we're going to hang our thoughts on before we we turn to uh, application. But the first one is this, and it's really the, the big hook. There's a big hook, there's a small hook. The big hook is the activity of the Word 
So we're going to take most of our time to talk about that. What is the word's activity? Because the word that we're introduced to in verse 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, is not a static word. It is a word that is on the move. It is a word that works powerfully. And we're going to see three words that describe the activity of the word. You'll notice the first two of them are in verse 14. The word became flesh. We're going to say the word comes. You might even put in the word down. The word comes down. That's the first great activity of the word from this text. The second one closely follows. The word became flesh. The word comes down and to dwell. He dwelt among us. That's the second great activity of the word. The word dwells with us. Well, We'll talk about the significance of the word dwelling with us. And then the last great activity of the word is, is found down in verse 18. And that is, uh, it's implied in verse 14, but clearly stated in verse 18. The, this word that comes down that is with us reveals something to us about God. He reveals something to us about the glory of God. So we're going to talk about the activity of the word around those three ideas. The word comes, the word dwells, and the word reveals. And then we'll see our response to that word, to that word's activity, to the word's work. And our response is, is important. It's not to be minimized. It's just not, the, uh, it's just not what's carrying the weight of this text. The, the word's activity is the great weight of this text. At the same time, though, we must respond as a believer, and a believer will respond to the Word's activity uh, in two ways. One, since the, the Word reveals something to us, we have to see it, we have to behold it, and then we have to receive it. So let's look at uh, this passage in that way. First of all, what the Word does, the activity of the Word, and then our response in, in responding to that work. The word comes. Let's look at verse 1 and 14 together. Read it like this. In the beginning was the word, and then jump down to verse 14, and the word became flesh. So what do we know about the word in verses 1 through 13? Well, we know this. We know that the word that was in the beginning is the eternal God. When the beginning... Uh, happened, the Word was already existing. We know from these first 13 verses that the Word is creator. All things were made through Him. There's nothing that was made that was not made by the agency of this Word that is God. This Word is the light that gives life and overcomes darkness. This Word is the Christ. That's what John the Baptizer testifies of. He witnesses to that. And this word's name is the basis by which God makes the believer right with him and gives him the right to be called a child of God. This is all that this word is. So in the beginning was the word. The word became flesh. Let's take all of those 13 verses together and see and remember just who this great, awesome Word is. Because when we get to verse 14, the issue is this. How does this great, awesome, eternal, creator Word get to us? How do we connect with this great Word? That's the question. I mean, we all know who we are. When we look at those first 13 verses, we sense our smallness and His awesomeness. So how does this awesome Word get to us? And the glorious answer to that is, He comes down. He comes down. The Word became flesh, meaning that He will now, in human flesh, experience things that humans experience, pain 
and hunger, thirst, weariness, and rejection, isolation, betrayal. When the Word becomes flesh, the Word then will experience everything that humans experience. And this is the miracle, the amazement of the incarnation. That incarnation, we use that word to describe the word becoming flesh. It means that God is incorporated into flesh, becomes a true human being that we know as Jesus. He is the perfect bridge. He's referred to as the God-man because he is truly God and he's truly man. He's the perfect bridge between God and man. Now, there's two big implications of this that we need to talk about just for a moment. The first one is this. This word becomes known to us because he comes down. Think about this. God who exists in perfection does not say to those who live in darkness, you figure out a way to find me. You figure out a way to get to me. That's not the gospel message. That's not the message of Christmas. It's the complete opposite of that. God comes down into the darkness of humans and in this world. That should never cease to amaze us. He comes down. He doesn't say, you figure out how to come up. In grace, he comes down. That is the first great implication of the incarnation. The word becomes flesh. God comes down. The second great implication is this. This whole idea of the word becoming flesh is not a pretty thing. If you're following in your notes, by the way, there's a little mistake I noticed in your notes. Sometimes I, I, I make little mistakes. And uh, your notes say this is pretty. It should say this isn't pretty. Flesh, this word flesh, is not describing something that's pretty. It's, it's quite the opposite. The word, the eternal word, the glorious light, becomes flesh. Flesh is, is kind of a gross word. It's kind, of a, it's kind of an icky word. I don't know if I'm the only dad here that's like this, but I, I kind of like to tease my daughter just a little bit, just a little bit. Would I be the only dad here that likes to tease his daughter just a little? And uh, a couple, couple summers ago, Deb had grilled for us some some wonderful steaks. Isn't that wonderful in the summertime? You get a nice steak that's grilled. And so we were getting ready to eat, and, and I said to Abby, I just love cow flesh. It's, I just love cow flesh. You know what she did. Oh, gross. Oh, I can't eat it now. I mean, it's cow flesh or it's a steak. See, the idea of flesh, that whole, ugh, that's the response that this word flesh is to, is to well up in us. This isn't a pretty thing. This is, this is really a, an ugly thing. I want you to see Isaiah 53. This is what the prophet said about him. This is Isaiah 53, verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You see, when, when we read that the Word became flesh 
And, and when we think about this incarnation, as glorious as it is, as awesome for us as it is, it also is describing something. God in, in all of His glory and perfection comes down into flesh, into flesh. The clearest text on the purpose of this, one of the clearest along with this is Philippians chapter 2. I want you to hear Philippians chapter 2 and the humility of the word where Paul says this in Philippians 2 verse 5, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, or he didn't see his place as God as something to hold on to, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, that's why he became flesh. He became flesh so that as flesh, he could be a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice for the sins of the world. That's why we say this is not a pretty thing, this flesh. Leviticus, Moses in Leviticus tells us this. This is Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is in the blood that makes atonement by the life. What's he saying? God has established this this law that the way sins would be atoned for is by the the giving of a life, and the giving of that life is seen in the shedding of the life's blood. And so the reason that the Word became flesh is so that this Word could, could be slaughtered, so that this Word would have flesh and blood that could be shed as an atoning sacrifice for sins. This week, and I don't even remember what song it was, I just remember Deb and I were listening to uh, the radio and it was doing some Christmas songs and there was, there was some Christmas song we were listening to. I'm almost glad I don't remember what the song was or who was singing it, but it just it talked about something like the, uh, the beauty of of the uh, manger, the beauty of the incarnation, and I just blurted out, have they even read the Bible? I mean, who, who wrote, have they even read the Bible? Because the whole point of the manger, the whole point of, of, of the Word becoming flesh is not a beauty thing. It, it is... Well, it's, it's, a, it's a death. It's a blood sacrifice. That's why the Word came down in flesh. So, the first great activity of the Word here is that the Word comes down. Now, notice this, though, also in verse 14. And the Word dwells. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Literally, this dwelt among us means to to tent with us or to pitch his tent with us. Now, those who who first read this in the culture in which they lived, especially Jewish people, right away would have made the connection with what John was saying, that the Word came down and tented with us, that the Word came down and pitched his tent with us. Because in their minds, there were two two great tents that they knew of from their, their history. And the first tent is what we know as the tabernacle. This is, this is a tent that God gave instructions for, to Moses and for the people to, to make in which there would be the sacrifices that would be offered to God. Inside this tabernacle, there was a place that was called the holy place. And it was there that the, the glory of God rested, but it was there that the people's 
sins would be atoned for with the bringing of a sacrifice. So the first great tent represents people coming to God by way of a sacrifice. The second great tent went along with it. It was called the tent of meeting. Sometimes we confuse the two, but there was a tent of meeting. It wasn't the tabernacle. The tent of meeting is where Moses would go, and there he would receive revelation from God. The people would come to him to have their different cases heard and judged, and Moses, getting revelation from God, then would would minister that wisdom and revelation of God to the people and to their needs. And so that other tent, the tent of meeting, uh, represents God Uh, coming down by way of revelation to minister his word and to reveal his will to people. So when you think about those two tents, you you get the full orb or the, the full understanding of what it is that God tented with us. Both in the word coming down, Jesus dwelling with us, we both have the aspect of the tent of of a sacrifice that's made to God. And then you have God who's coming down then to relate to and to reveal himself to people. God dwelling with us. The word is God dwelling with us. All of that is it's what's wrapped up in that name Emmanuel. God is with us. And so God is with us, therefore God can dwell with people because their sins are atoned for by way of sacrifice and because he then can reveal himself and his will, his word, to his people. This, of course, made all the difference in the world to know that God was with them. It meant that God's protection, God's blessing, even God's joy God's forgiveness, God's mercy, God's grace, all of these things are wrapped up in God dwelling with his people. This is a theme, one of the mega themes throughout the Bible. God dwelling with his people. God came down to walk with Adam and Eve in the garden, and after their sin, God still made a way that he would be able to come down and to fellowship with his people by way of of a sacrifice. And, of course, ultimately the great sacrifice would be made by this word, his son, that would come down to die for our sins. The second great activity here of the word is that the word dwells with us. And I want you to see the third, as we go down to the verse 18, the third great work of the, world, of the word, and that is the word reveals God. Verse 14, he became flesh, dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory... The glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. But then verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Or in other words, he has revealed him. So the glory of the Father is seen in the glory of the Son. So think about that. When John and others saw the Lord Jesus, when they heard him, They were seeing, they were hearing um, the glory of God. They were were getting an idea, a revelation, an understanding of God and his glory. So they, they, they see the glory of God as revealed through the power of the Son. And so he speaks and this great storm is calmed. They see the glory of God in that. They see the glory of God's compassion when in the little town of Nain, Jesus sees a funeral procession. It's it's really wonderful the way Luke Luke records it because he says that when Jesus saw the mother of this son, her only son that had died weeping, it says he was moved because of the mother's tears. We see the glory of God's compassion in Jesus this Jesus. We see the glory of God's forgiveness. Remember the three friends that lowered their fourth friend who was lame down through the roof of a house that Jesus might heal him. And Jesus not only healed him, but he said, your sins are forgiven. 
We see the glory of God's holiness. They saw the glory of God's holiness in Jesus as he drives out the the money changers from the temple and says, this will be a house of prayer. They saw, saw the glory of God's wisdom, even as a boy, as he profound the teachers of the day in the temple. See the glory of God's provision in which he feeds 5,000 with a small boy's lunch. The point is, John is saying that as we saw Jesus, what we were seeing as we saw Jesus is revelation of the glory of God. And notice this. This, I think, is very significant to see in verse 14. Obviously, language has its limitations, but John describes the glory of Jesus with these words. He says that he was full of of grace and truth. He's, he's revealing the glory of God, and he's full of grace and truth. To be full is to be complete. It talks about sufficiency. And in Kittle's theological dictionary, he, he says this, as it relates to the soul, it was something that was satisfying. I love to think of that. This grace and truth of Jesus is something that is soul satisfying because people try to satisfy their souls in so many ways. People try to satisfy their souls through money and fame and success. And yet the true glory of God is seen in the fullness, the sufficiency, the soul satisfying revelation of God through Jesus Christ who's full of grace and truth. Jesus revealed the glory of God when he walked this earth, when he taught his disciples, when he taught the the multitudes, all of this being revelation of God's glory. However, it was just a limited revelation of God's glory because the, the human being a human in flesh, there's only so much glory that he is able to reveal. And uh, by the way, I, I was uh, looking again at the, uh, the words to hark the herald angels sing and reminded that uh, really two great men in church history together wrote that. Charles Wesley is the one who's most noted for writing Hark the Herald Angels Sing, the text to it, not the song, but the, or, or not the music, but the text to it. But uh, it was also um, revised by George Whitfield. That's kind of interesting if you know anything about their history and their theologies were, were uh, somewhat different, but together they wrote that great text of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And I was just reflecting on it this week because the second verse we sing the words that he was veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. They're saying the same thing John was saying. They're saying that the Godhead was seen in Jesus, but it was a veiled revelation, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Again, what they're saying is the same thing that John was saying, that even though he revealed the glory of God. That revelation of God's glory is a veiled revelation because of the limits of human flesh. But I just wanted us to be reminded this morning as well that although what John saw was glorious, it was amazing, it was awesome, he also was given the opportunity to get sort of a sneak peek of the future glory that would come when the glorified Christ would come in his second coming and the glorified Christ in the glorified flesh in his second coming will bring an unveiled display of the glory of God. And we get a taste of that in, they did in the transfiguration. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, it's like the curtain was peeled back just a bit and they saw Christ in this glorious, in in a glorified state in this, this uh, light that was shining, and that was to give them and us a foretaste of Revelation 21, verse 23. When describing the eternal state, it says, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, 
And here's specifically where that light comes from. And it's lamp, so what it is that's lighting, the lamp is the lamb. And so one day we will see the full revelation of God's glory manifested through the, the glorified Christ. But still, John says this, when he was on earth, when we saw him, we were seeing a revelation of God. No one has seen God, but this Son, this Word, has revealed him to us. So the Word comes down, the Word dwells with us, and the Word then reveals to us the glory of God. Let's just consider our response to that. First of all, we have to behold this. This, I think, is a very important thing for us to notice. We first behold his glory. The ESV translates that we have seen. The New King James says we beheld. Again, in Kittle's Theological Dictionary, I do want you to grasp this. It's, he says this word is used of visionary seeing. By that he means, you know, sometimes you might think of a, of a leader as being visionary meaning they, they see things that others don't see, or they, they look ahead, and they're visionary in that sense. That's what he's saying this word, behold, describes. It's visionary seeing. And then he says it's the apprehension of higher realities. In other words, this is more than just eyewitnessing something. This is true seeing. This is the kind of seeing that you do with your mind and your heart and your soul and your strength. So I want you to, to see this in our response, that when the Word comes and the Word dwells and the Word then reveals to us the glory of God, the first response to that is a seeing, a higher reality. It is a beholding of His glory. Before John and the disciples did anything, did anything, they first beheld something. They beheld the glory of God as seen in Christ. That's a very important thing. I think we tend to, to see it like this. You get a revelation of God through Christ, through His Word, and then we right away think, all right, what do we do? All right, what service should we render? We got to get busy, got to pray more, got to read more, got to do more. I think it's very significant for us to stop and to see this. Before John talks about doing anything in relation to the Word and seeing the Word, we must behold Him. This is a very significant aspect of worship. When we come together on Sundays, to worship. I realize that all of life is worship. All of life is to be a sacrifice of praise. But understand, like, we, can, we can kind of muddy it all together and say, well, it's all just worship. Well, there is a distinction to be made in how we worship and the kind of worship we offer. And yes, your life that you live is a life of sacrifice and praise unto God. It is a life of worship. But but let's not muddy it to where we fail to realize that the people of God coming together, not to do anything, but simply coming together to behold Him. That's worship. And that's the kind of worship that we can only do together collectively as the people of God beholding Him. It's a very, very significant response. And yes, certainly individually you can and should do that. But there's, a, there's an aspect of worship that we cannot miss, and that is the corporate people of God. We, John says, beheld him. We saw him, we, we beheld him, and we together do that in corporate worship to the Lord. Let me just say this as well. There's a sense in which John is telling us that there's a self, um, self-authentication, let's, put, let's say it that way, 
of the word, of seeing the word. Meaning that we saw him, we see him calm the storm, we see him heal the sick, we see him give the blind their sight, we see him raise the dead, we hear him teach, we, we see and we hear him. And John is saying in that there's a self-authentication that this word is God, that this word is revealing to us the glory of God. And John Piper says it this way, you, you taste honey and know it's sweet, not because you do a three-year dissertation on it, not because you, you go to college to learn about honey. It's self-authenticating. You eat it and you say, this is sweet. It's the same way as seeing the Grand Canyon and saying, this is awesome. It's not, you don't say that as the result of a long line of reasoning. You see, and then you say, this is awesome. It's self-authenticating. That's the point. And that's the point of, of John saying, we, we beheld him. There's a self-authenticating work of this word that when you see him, you are seeing the glory of God. So we behold him. And of course, today we know we behold him through his word. Part of that word as John has given to us, this glorious gospel specifically about Jesus Christ. Then just quickly look at the second response, and that is to receive. We receive. It's the same word that's used back in 12, It's a little different, though. Back in verse 12, we receive him. It's more active in saving faith. We believe on his name, and that's what it is to believe on him in a way that receives him. Here, this receiving is more passive, and yet still, John says, verse 16, and from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Again, there's something about this word that when you believe on him in a way that receives him, you receive then grace upon grace. He literally is the gift that continues to give. And John wants us to see that, that continuing aspect, that residual effect of knowing this word. He is grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There's a certain grace in the law, but the clearest, boldest, most glorious display of grace is in the person of Jesus Christ. One other thing let's see is this. Notice how John uses the word us, how he uses the word we. And let's stop and remember this, because you might ask, is John just talking about himself and the disciples? Is he just talking about those who were there with him? Or is he talking about more than that? I think it's clear he's talking about more than that because he's writing this some 40 to 50 years after the fact. And and as he's looking back on that, he's seeing that this receiving of the grace that comes through this word that is God in the flesh, that we know as Jesus, is for everyone. It's it's for all. It's not just for those who actually saw him then, but it's for those who would see him, not physically with their eyes, but in their hearts, who would see and believe. At the end of this gospel, there's there's a little exchange between Jesus and Thomas. And you might remember Jesus says to Thomas, put your your finger here in my hands and your hand in my side. Yes, it is me. But then Jesus says this, blessed are those who believe. Remember, this whole gospel is written that you might believe. Blessed are those who believe, not because they see, but blessed are those who don't see and believe. So all the way through this gospel, John is appealing, when he says us, when he says we, he's not just talking about those who actually literally saw Jesus with their eyes, but all of those who would see him in their hearts, who would believe in him. Now, 
what is Christmas all about and what does it matter? I want to talk about that just for a moment before we go. All of us need this text today because all of us need to know personally the compassionate Savior who comes down and is with us, who comes down and identifies with us. He took on flesh that he might identify with us in our weakness. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says this, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. He comes down in flesh that he might identify with us in our weakness and in offering himself as our sacrifice become our high priest who through his sacrifice brings us to God. Everything he said about himself, he is, and everything he promised to do, he does. As he comes down and identifies with us as our compassionate Savior, he understands and sympathizes with us perfectly. He understands you in your grief. He too stood by the tomb of his friend. He felt the pain of hunger at the end of a busy, hot day and yet fed thousands with the lunch of a small boy. He felt the dark face of loneliness himself, as well as when he looked in the face of the rejected Nicodemus who came to see him. He felt the anguish of difficult decisions, and yet he still did the will of God. He felt thirst and asked a woman for a drink. He felt the disappointment of not meeting the expectations of family, yet he still completed his mission. He felt the frustration of difficult students, even those that would betray him, those that were close to him. He felt the pain of injustice and disappointment and lowliness. And yet, as the writer of Hebrews says, he was not constrained or drained by the shackles of sin. He came down to identify with us as a compassionate Savior who is our priest that brings us to God. No one understands you and me like the Lord Jesus Christ does. No one. That's why you came down. That's why you need to know him. That's why you need to believe in him. You also need him because you need a Savior who not only identifies with you, in your weakness, but you need a Savior who is able to redeem you and to bring you to God. The simple truth of the gospel is that this one, this word, came in flesh to dwell with us, to reveal to us the glory of God. And in doing so, he lived a life that you and I could not live. He died the substitutionary death that had to be made to satisfy God. Someone had to pay for sins. Someone who was capable and sufficient to pay for sins. Someone had to remove the wrath of God from us. And he rose from the dead to vindicate God and his glory and his holiness. And now he works through his spirit and his word to redeem a people unto himself for his glory. He is so committed to this word, this eternal son, this word, and so committed to the praise of his own glory that he became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only one of the Father, full of grace and truth. And it's this special one John calls us to believe in. We need a compassionate Savior to identify with us, and we need a powerful Redeemer to bring us to God.